All right, um, we're going to go ahead and get started. We're right at the top of the hour. Um, so I just want to say welcome to everyone who's joining the webinar. Um, and thank you all so much for joining us today and taking the time to be here. Um, my name is Kayla Ripple, and I'm a senior associate with the Lenfest Ocean Program. Um, so for those of you who may not know us, the Lenfest Ocean Program is a grant making program that funds ocean and coastal research projects and expert working groups to address the needs that are facing decision makers and stakeholders today. You can learn more about us and the projects we fund at lenfestocean.org. And while you're there, you can also sign up for our newsletter. Um, also, if you're on Twitter, be sure to follow us at Lenfest Ocean. We'll actually be live tweeting this webinar today on the hashtag LOP webinar. So feel free to use it too if you'd like to engage with us there. Um, the webinar today is our fourth and final installment of our Species on the Move webinar series that features new research from our Ideas Lab that took place in 2019 and was focused on generating research priorities for shifting fish stocks. The three previously recorded webinars can be found on our YouTube page and I'll drop the link in the chat um, in case anyone is interested to see those too. Um, but for today, we're very excited to have joining us Dr. Tim Essington with the University of Washington, Dr. Ariel Levine, University of San Diego, and Dr. Marissa Basket with UC Davis. Also on the research team is Dr. Kathy Mills and Dr. Abigail Golden. Um, Abigail is joining us as a panelist today and at the end during the Q&A, um, she's here to help answer any questions that might pop up. So thank you to all of our speakers and panelists for being here today. We really appreciate your time and are very excited to hear about your project. Um, so our speakers will be sharing an overview of their new research project uh, to better understand the barriers and opportunities for applying adaptive capacity in fisheries management. This topic was heavily discussed during the ideas lab and the research team has taken great care to best understand what research questions could be most useful in addressing the topic. I'll let them dive into the details, but from our perspective at Lenfest, we see this project as an important step in helping to bridge the gap between a well-studied academic concept and its potential to be used in a management setting. And another note on this webinar, this is what we refer to as a launch webinar, where the research team is sharing details at the start of their research um, with the aim to increase transparency and stakeholder engagement throughout the project, rather than just doing the project and then sharing the results at the end with all of you. So if you'd like to, we definitely encourage you to reach out to members of the research team and us at Lenfest if you have any questions or would like to engage further after today. And now before we get started, I just wanted to share a few webinar logistics with everyone. Um, with so many people in attendance, we have all attendees muted to prevent any feedback or echoes. And there will be time at the end for questions. So please use the Q&A panel to type and submit your question at any point during the webinar today. I'll be keeping track of those in the queue. And then at the end, I'll read the questions aloud for the researchers to answer. Depending on how many questions there are, we may not have time to get to them all, but folks are certainly welcome to follow up with us here at Lenfest or with the research team afterwards. And finally, we are committed to making Lenfest funded work transparent and easily accessible for all stakeholders. So we'll be recording this webinar and we'll distribute the link broadly afterwards. Please feel free to share this with others who may be interested or weren't able to make it today. As this project goes on, we'll continue to share information on its progress via a variety of avenues, like on our website, on lenfestocean.org, in our newsletter, on Twitter, and other places and venues as they pop up and seem appropriate. But for now, I've started creating a running distribution list for everyone who's interested. Uh, if you're not sure that you're on that list, just send me a note to include you, and I'll be sure to put you on that list. Uh, you can find my email on this slide here, please feel free to send me a note um, and I'll get you at it. And then lastly, after you close out of the webinar, you'll be taken to a very short three question survey. Um, this helps us to better understand the best way to engage with you and with others as we continue outreach around this project. So please take a few minutes to fill this out. At the end, we'd be 
very grateful for any feedback you can provide us. And with that, um, I think we've covered all the bases. So we'll go ahead and get started and I'll turn things over to Dr. Essington. Um, Tim, I'm gonna pass presenter privileges to you now. And you should be able to share your screen. I think you're right. All right, I am sharing my screen and if it's okay, yeah, looks great. Yeah, looks good. All right, take um, it away. Thanks, Tim. Yeah. And I'm gonna try to turn my video on so people can actually see me. Hi, thanks everyone for uh, coming this late morning or afternoon, depending where you are. Um, also, thanks, K Kayla. It was a perfect introduction. Um, I think really uh, described the essence of what this uh, research uh, project is about. Um, if, if you tuned in to see a really detailed academic study of adaptive capacity, uh, uh, you're going to be disappointed because uh, what we are really talking about is really studying the application of the principles of adaptive capacity in the context of fisheries decision making. So, as mentioned, uh, we have a fantastic team that's part of this project. Um, the, the, the four uh, individuals on the left hand side of your screen are the people who participated in the ideas lab and, and helped generate the idea. And we are really excited uh, that um, Abigail Golden has agreed to join our team uh, starting in autumn of this year uh, after she finishes her dissertation. Um, I want to particularly uh, introduce you to Abigail because um, likely she'll be doing a, a lot of the outreach and heavy lifting. So um, likely be seeing emails from her. Um, so uh, urge you to pay attention to those. So just to set the stage, I, I want to clarify what this group is talking about when we talk about adaptive capacity. If you've looked at the literature at all on this topic, you'll find that uh, the descriptions of adaptive capacity are all over the map. Um, in fact, it's a it's a pretty um, uh, a confusing landscape to try to get a handle on all this. So the the we we just went ahead and adopted a particular interpretation. So what, when we talk about adaptive capacity, it's sort of two bits is one, it's the ability of a system. So the, the whole broad uh, interconnected pieces, in this case, a fishery system to cope with change. So change is some external perturbation uh, while continuing to deliver the desired ecological, economic and social outcomes. So uh, obviously that is an attribute that is very positive because um, presumably systems have these attributes that uh, allow for this type of coping that then deliver all these uh, desired outcomes. So why, why does it matter? So I, what I thought I would just set some context so why I personally got really drawn to the ideas of uh, adaptation and adaptive capacity, particularly in the context of global environmental change. And uh, some, some really inspirational work that um, motivated me was work that my colleagues here at the University of Washington uh, have done studying um, sockeye salmon runs up in the Wood River system of Alaska. And what they revealed is um, that that system is, is really, um, uh, has a lot of adaptive capacity because of the inherent heterogeneity of the ecological system. So in this particular case, the ecological system consists of many, many different runs of sockeye salmon. Thankfully, the, the, the landscape has been uh, preserved and protected that allows for that natural heterogeneity and any individual stock will fluctuate and go up and down. But what the fishing fleet sees is a much more stable uh, ability to catch salmon from year over year, particularly compared to what they would be able to harvest if they only had a limited number of those runs to harvest. So in this case, uh, this system is able to cope with change uh, because of the heterogeneity of the system that sustains the ability of the fleet to continually catch sockeye salmon. As a counterexample, uh, just move down to California, where the, in this case, the fall Chinook salmon run has been homogenized. It's lost its heterogeneity through a, a variety of, of human interventions. And as a result, when there's an external uh, force on the system, say an environmental change, the effects are much more profound uh, on the human side. 
So that's sort of one example, a very salmon specific. Um, I, another example, and I saw that Dan Holland is on here, and this is actually drawing on work that Dan Holland and um, his colleague Steve uh, Kaspersky did, is uh, looking at um, a, a fleet diversity. So in this case, the ability of fishing uh, individual fishing vessels to essentially move across fisheries uh, through time. And, but with a similar uh, idea being that um, those fisheries that have the or vessels that have the ability to switch fisheries or in the sort of the council parlance to fish uh, into, into different fishery management plans uh, have a, a more stable uh, income uh, than those that rely on a single fishery. Again, it's that same buffering. In this case, the, the, it's the, the key element is the flexibility to move from one fishery to another. And again, a, a counter example of that comes from the uh, uh, very well known and very tragic Newfoundland cod collapse that happened in the early 1900s or early 1990s. Uh, here, the particularly the nearshore uh, fleet was highly dependent on uh, uh, Atlantic cod. Uh, the processors were highly dependent on Atlantic cod. The system, of course, underwent a profound environmental shift that lowered the productivity of cod. The, the collapse of the cod is very well known. Um, at the same time, the ecological system responded by an outburst of shrimp productivity. But the, the system lacked the flexibility of those near shore fishermen to then uh, take advantage of that resource that was offshore. And as a result, um, the system was not able to sustain the, the benefits because there was one very important segment of the, of the fishery system uh, that basically had devastating uh, consequences of the cod collapse. So a lack of adaptive capacity was really, really profound. So I hope these examples have sort of set the, set the frame for what we are thinking about and why adaptive capacity uh, is relevant and how it benefits things. In the context of shifting species distributions, you know, I think we're all aware that, you know, given rapid rates of environmental change, species are moving further offshore, they're moving towards the poles, often changing jurisdictions. So there's a lot of change happening. So uh, ideally, we would have fishery management systems that are making decisions that protect the elements of the fishery systems to cope with that change, much like the examples I showed previously. And what we would hopefully avoid is making decisions that in the short run, short run seem very sensible, but in the long run are potentially eroding the adaptive capacity of the system to respond to change that we know is happening. And that's the fundamental element that this, this project's kind of interested in. So to, to kind of like maybe just tie up this little piece, I, what, I th what I thought I'd do is just actually give, sort of tell the story of how we landed on really focusing on the application of the principles in fisheries management. So um, if, if you all take your minds back to uh, 2019, back in the era where people got on planes um, and they talked face to face with people, um, as Kayla mentioned, there was this uh, very, well-run ideas lab that was held um, by Lenfest in October 2019. And right away, I and a handful of us got um, interested in the idea of exploring adaptive capacity as one of the things that we might be able to do to add to the portfolio of Lenfest research on species distribution shifts and fisheries management. And uh, I, I wanna tell the story because uh, I, I think it helps explain why we're doing this and what we're really focusing on and other things. And we essentially went through a couple of phases. And we, we started off on what I'm calling this aspirational phase, which was we were gonna do this enormous global meta-analysis of fisheries around the world. We were gonna uh, identify these generalizable uh, attributes that give adaptive capacity to systems and therefore uh, individual fisheries managers could do a very rapid assessment of their fishery system, figure out what are the attributes that are giving them adaptive capacity, and then could make decisions accordingly. It sounded great at the time. As we dug more into the details of how we might to do that, we immediately got hit with three really, really key issues. Uh, the first is uh, adaptive capacity itself is, is kind of an unobservable attribute of, of fishery systems. You, you really only see adaptive capacity when a system gets hit 
uh, and particularly when um, it gets hit and it doesn't adapt. So you almost sort of see it after the fact. Uh, the, the other uh, key issue is we realize by sort of digging into the work that other people have done in, in a lot more detail is that quite likely the attributes that provide for adaptive capacity are probably highly, highly contextual. You know, what is important in one region and one fishery is probably going to be different than another one. So the whole goal of having generalizable attributes probably uh, is um, uh, not, not going to pan out. And then, um, you know, this aspirational phase idea uh, had some uh, contributions to decision making, but we really wanted something that was more tightly linked to decision making. So, given all of those considerations, we we pivoted because then we uh, we realized there was an opportunity because we saw that there seemed to be a pretty stark divide between uh, the rich academic literature and theory of adaptive capacity, and then the actual practice of decision making. So. If, if you ever want to do a, a long involved Google Scholar search, you can just type in adaptive capacity into Google Scholar or your favorite search engine and you will get hit with a lot of papers. So there's there's no shortage of smart minds thinking about this in a lot of detail. Many of those papers will actually acknowledge that um, there, there's an absence of concrete, actual, practical guidance of how to actually implement those ideas into decision making. And when they are present, they tend to kind of be heuristics or generic. So there'll, there'll be something like preserve heterogeneity broadly without giving the specific guidance of how do you actually evaluate that at a, at a system level um, or how to balance that against other fishery decision needs. So this, this project is really just focused on that divide um, as opposed to the theory itself. So the three uh, main things that we hope to do as part of this project is first, Try to clarify the purpose and benefits of adaptive capacity as a concept and adaptive capacity assessments, but do so in ways that resonate better with fisheries decision making, fishery decision makers. Um, we want to assess the degree to which uh, the principles of adaptive capacity are perhaps currently being uh, 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 currently being used to guide decision making. Uh, it, it's likely, or at least possible, that these considerations are weighing on decision making. They're just not being labeled as such. And then finally, when they're not being applied, try to identify what are the barriers that are that are that prevent them. So is, is it a lack of scientific knowledge, is it institutional, or are there just social political barriers to doing so? So that gives you an overview of kind of where we are. What I'm going to do is hand it off to um, uh, Ariel Levine, and she's going to tell you a little bit more about uh, what specifically we we aim, how we, but specifically we're going to tackle this. Thanks, Tim. Um, I think my my audio is on now. So in in trying to help bridge this divide. Um, our project involves four key research questions. Tim, do you want to go ahead and forward to the next slide? Thanks. Um, first of all, we want to know, do decision makers believe that they're considering adaptive capacity in their decision making? And if so, do concepts align with the concepts um, in academic literature? The next question um, is, in what ways did decision makers adopt academic concepts of adaptive capacity in decision making? And how does that depend on local context? Next one. <laughs> uh, we're also interested in what are the barriers to wider implementation of adaptive capacity? Um, are there technical barriers? Is it limitations in knowledge, social, political barriers? Are they institutional or legal? What, what do people see as the key barriers to implementing adaptive capacity in decision making and policy? And what are the institutional, technical, or governance changes that would make decision makers more likely to explicitly consider adaptive capacity, as well as what kind of information is needed to incorporate adaptive capacity into decision making? Next slide. So we came up. Um, and when our discussions to develop this project, we came up with several hypothesized barriers to the uptake of concepts of adaptive capacity in fisheries decision making. The first one is, you know, 
perhaps decision makers or policy makers disagree with the fundamental tenets of the concept of adaptive capacity. Um, or it may be that there's a belief that incorporating these concepts will not benefit the management concept, concept context in which people are operating. Uh, there may be insufficient science to support adaptive capacity informed decision making. Or it could be that there's social or political barriers, um, maybe conflicts among stakeholders or a lack of space in the decision making process um, or bureaucratic barriers. Or it could be just that there's a lack of a policy mandate to do so and people are driven by other policy mandates. Um, and this is really just a preliminary list of factors that our group thought might be barriers to incorporating adaptive capacity into management and decision making. But one of the main things we'd like to get out of this project is to determine if any of these are truly relevant and are there other barriers that we may not have considered that impede adaptive capacity. Uh, next slide. So in attempting to answer our questions and learn more about barriers to adaptive capacity in fisheries policy and management, our project has several key elements, starting with assembling an advisory panel, but also including developing some short vignettes to better explain academic concepts and adapt adaptive capacity, conducting key informant interviews, uh, conducting a web-based survey of individuals involved in fishery management, and collating fishery data to characterize the ecological and decision-making context in different regions. So our first step will be to convene an advisory panel of representatives from different fishery management regions and institutions to get perspectives from people who are familiar with fishery policy and understand different management and institutional contexts. And we've also included experts from non-fishery fields to potentially learn from work conducted in other natural resource disciplines. This advisory panel will inform our work throughout the project. Um, in particular, they will help us to refine the scope and our hypotheses. Um, and to help in refining our survey questions to ensure that they're relevant to the context in which people are actually making decisions. The advisory panel will also assist us in interpreting our findings and in and understanding what these findings might mean for paths forward. We've listed our current advisory panel members here, and I'd say this is a close to finalized member list, um, but one of the first orders of business once we meet with this panel um, will be to identify any missing expertise and try to fill those gaps. Next slide. So before we begin um, the surveys or the interviews, we plan to summarize and distill the science of adaptive capacity from the academic literature into short vignettes, either printed or video or a combination of the two, that we will show to interview and survey participants to ensure that all participants have a similar understanding of what adaptive capacity is, how it's assessed, the types of fishery attributes that enhance adaptive capacity, and its benefits to fisheries. Um, we'll use the advisory panel to evaluate the accessibility of these vignettes, um, and we'll also seek guidance on developing them from the Marine Resource Education Program at the Gulf of Maine Marine Institute. Next, thanks. Uh, the first step in our research process will be to conduct key informant interviews with representatives from each fishery management region in the U.S. These interviews will consist of open-ended questions based on our primary research questions, and in particular, evaluating the relevance of our hypothesized barriers to the uptake of key concepts and tenets of adaptive capacity in fisheries management. The outcomes of these key informant interviews will help us craft a more targeted web-based survey. Uh, next slide. And this web-based survey will be distributed to a much broader range of individuals involved in fishery management and decision-making, including re regional fishery management council members and council executive staff, uh, scientists and administrators who are engaged in the council ma uh, management process, and commissioners and advisors in the Pacific States and Atlantic States Marine Fisheries Commissions. The purpose of the survey will be to gather information on specific barriers and enabling conditions for incorporating adaptive capacity, and this will differ from the key informant interviews, which will be much more open ended, whereas in our survey, we'll ask the degree to which specific identified barriers are relevant to survey respondents. Um, we also want to assess the degree to which respondents believe adaptive capacity is being used to enhance decision making in the context that they're working in um, and whether they think the uptake of adaptive capacity concepts um, is important. Um, and 
we'll also try to gain a better understanding of some of the characteristics in each fishery uh, region during these uh, surveys. Next slide. And in addition, in order to better understand the context in which decisions are made and the concepts of adaptive capacity are or are not being incorporated into management, um, as well as the barriers to doing so, we'll be collating fishery data specific to each region. We'll explore whether there are differences in our survey results that might correspond to specific aspects of the fishery's social, ecological, or management systems. Uh, and now I'll pass it over to Marissa to explain how we hope to apply our findings. All right, thank you, Ariel. And so to recap the insights that we hope to gain, as Ariel and Tim described, uh, what we're out of all of this, we expect to be able to identify how adaptive capacity is being considered, already being considered, uh, the potential technical, knowledge, social, political, institutional, and legal barriers to implementation of adaptive capacity, and the uh, institutional, technical, or governance changes that could increase the adoption of adaptive capacity. So all of this together, we hope will provide a path forward towards climate ready, ready fisheries that do account for adaptive capacity capacity in terms of identifying what issues are shared across regions and fisheries, which ones are unique to each regions. And so that context dependency that Ariel just described, that comparison across regions and fisheries um, will be crucial to that and help us determine whether or not it's actually possible to come up with generalized guidance on decision-making process or whether it is inevitably context dependent. And even if it is, um, the articulation of what it depends on will provide actionable information. Next slide. And so uh, by actionable, we need to connect it to specific fishery management decisions. And in terms of anticipating the types of decisions we expect to inform, uh, when you look at the literature on adaptive capacity, whether it's the social science literature or the natural science literature, you see diversity, redundancy, and heterogeneity coming up over and over. Um, so we expect to inform decisions around anything that affects flexibility and heterogeneity. Uh, Tim earlier provided two examples of this in terms of fleet diversity diversification or ecological heterogeneity and the enhancement or preservation of those. But that could there are additional aspects one might consider like uh, allocation and access privileges, seasonal and regional flexibility and quotas, and livelihood diversity as well. Next slide. And so just to give an example of the type of insight that might come from this, not saying that this will be an insight that comes from this, uh, but as a pure hypothetical, if one of the things we find is that the political and legal dimensions of fishery management plans are one of the barriers that the, of uh, implementing adaptive capacity, that if it's just not fitting in the um, structure of how those management plans come together and play out, then a possible action one might take is to step away from trying to push adaptive capacity into that and instead bring it more into fishery ecosystem planning, which could allow potentially a more flexible and strategic and less uh, politically and legally constrained approach to bringing in principles of adaptive capacity. Next slide. Uh, and so all of this involves engagement. Engagement is at the heart of this. Um, Ariel described our advisory panel who will be involved from day one of this project and at multiple points in order to keep us grounded. Um, also, we are going to be uh, making sure that this information uh, reaches all of the relevant audiences through broad webinars and have targeted conversations with individuals for whom this might be particularly useful. So dialogues with decision makers, and that's not just us disseminating information to you, but also making that a two-way conversation so we can make sure we are refining our interpretation and our recommendations to make uh, what we bring out of this as useful as possible. Possible. Next slide. And so that means we need your help. Uh, you, uh, some of, many of you in the audience will be among those that we will be sending the survey that Ariel described. So this is our plea. Please do respond to interview and survey requests. It will make a better product and a better ability to support you um, and help us uh, be able to better understand what's going on in 
bringing adaptive capacity to actionable terms. Um, but also just any general feedback from you, and we really appreciate Lenfest giving us this opportunity to have this conversation now. We would love to hear, are there any areas of fisheries decision making we might have overlooked? Are there any contacts that are, would be really important for us to make right now? Are there any considerations for how we disseminate these results uh, that we haven't yet highlighted? So thank you all for coming and listening, and we would love to take your questions. Awesome, thank you. Thank you all so much um, for that wonderful overview and presentation of your new research project. Um, I'm gonna go ahead and share my screen again. Um, and Tim, I'm gonna take back those presenter privileges from you so I can do uh -huh. now. <laughs> Um, yeah, so I'm going to share my screen. It's going to have contact information for uh, myself at LenFest and then also uh, the speakers that are here today. So please feel free to jot that down, take a screenshot um, so that you have that information um, and you can reach out to any of us. We would be happy to continue having conversations with you all. Um, I am getting lots of questions so far um, in the Q&A. Let me just try to, let me pull those back up because I think I actually just lost them. Here we go, more Q&A. <laughs> um, and if I could just ask all of the people who are attending today, if you can put your questions into that Q&A chat box. I know there's a chat box and there's a Q&A box. If you could put your questions in Q&A, it's actually a lot easier for me to monitor that um, as opposed to um, two different boxes. So if you have a question, please put it in there. Um, and also, once we get to our first question, I'm going to put a fact sheet that we have um, for this project. And all of you are welcome to share that with others. Um, it's a really good overview of sort of what you heard today. So it might be a good resource. Um, so I'm going to go to our first question and um, speakers, panelists, feel free to just answer. Um, I'm not going to direct this towards an individual. Um, so if it sounds like it's most relevant for you to answer, go for it. Um, so our first question um, is highly specialized vessels have major limitation to diversify harvest. Should future shipbuilding be managed towards more adaptable towards a more adaptable unit? Yeah, I'll, I'll take a stab at that. I mean, I think um, it's a really great, great point. And I, I think it's about what, what are the incentives um, that lead to vessels themselves being highly specialized. So I, I think that really gets to the crux of what we're talking about here is um, uh, the fishery decision and regulatory arena uh, might be creating these incentives towards more and more, in this case, vessel specialization, specialization. Uh, that therefore would er erode the adaptive capacity. So that that's that's essentially the type of thing that we were hoping to um, that would what we're hoping for is an outcome where uh, fishery decision makers have a, a better way of thinking about. Hey, I'm making this policy regulation that makes a lot of sense right now. Uh, in what way might that erode future adaptive capacity? And, and maybe maybe this particular example is a really good one. Maybe it's going to incentivize changes that are really long term that we don't want. Excellent. Thank you. Um, our next question asks, in your survey, are you hoping to capture perspectives from the Coast Guard or Department of Natural Resources? So looking more at that enforcement angle. I guess I'll go. <laughs> I'll let Ariel jump in if you want. I, I, I can. If, I mean, you know, <laughs> we we haven't included um, enforcement officers or people involved in the enforcement angle in our list of uh, people who we are planning to survey. Um, but but that's an excellent question, um, and it may be that we need to capture a broader perspective, not just getting at people who are involved in the you know council management process and those type of management processes, but also people who are involved in enforcing policies and regulations, um, because that could be a critical angle of adaptive capacity that we're missing. Um, so that's a good question and something I think for our our team to consider. 
Great, thank you. Um, so this next question, uh, maybe we can get your thoughts on that. It's kind of a statement. Um, so <laughs> wondering about your thoughts on uh, consumers and should they be educated to diversify and adapt their consumption pattern? I, I can give my thoughts on, on this. <laughs> um, I think something that we may find um, is that, um, you know, that consumer demand is one of the things that's constraining adaptive capacity. Um, and, and I wouldn't, I'm, I'm, I, in, in two other fisheries that I've been working with in California, actually, that's, that's something that we have started finding. Um, uh, the lobster and the squid fishery, um, currently, almost all of the catch goes to China because that's where the demand is and that's where they get the best, um, I, get, I guess, not necessarily the best price, but um, it, it, it's consistent demand and there's tremendous demand. And when they weren't able to export um, during the COVID-19 due to export restrictions, um, the demand completely dropped. And that really showed kind of a lack of adaptive capacity to an external shock, um, such as a pandemic. Um, and so people did start trying to build up more diverse markets, um, like local markets and kind of local fishermen's markets or local restaurant demand once restaurants were operating again. Um, but then once, you know, the export market opened up again, most of the um, product goes offshore again to China. And so there's not a very diverse market there, um, which makes it, which I think reduces the adaptive capacity of those two fisheries. Um, I don't know if necessarily educating people to adapt their consumption patterns I think that's a hard thing to do, but I think kind of seeking diversity, not just, um, you know, seeking diversity in markets is also another way that um, adaptive capacity could be enhanced. Um, so I think that's a, it's a, you know, you bring up an ex excellent point there and it's an interesting question. Great, thank you. And not that Marissa or Tim, you have to answer, but I just want to offer <laughs> an opportunity if you did have something you wanted to add on to that. All good? Perfect. Thanks. Um, so this next question, um, firstly says, great talk. Thank you so much for sharing. Um, what are elements of adaptive capacity and management frameworks that would ensure equitable use and allocation of resources? Um, so I could speak a little bit to this one. The one area that equity really comes in is in terms of quota allocation when you have ITQ systems and um, how uh, quota trading might go, especially as um, opportunities for that as species distribution shift. And so uh, cooperatives around quotas uh, that could support uh, smaller scale fisheries um, and, and actions like that might, uh, if, if we're just anticipating as people, obviously a lot of this is gonna come from the survey, but might be an area where we might anticipate that. And another is in disaster funds. Uh, could be another source of supporting fishery communities during extreme events um, and whether or not that's a part of adaptive capacity um, that how that is managed and plays out is another area where equity equity could really come into play. Great, thank you. Um, all right, next question. Are you currently collaborating with regional fishery management council staffs? I, uh, I guess we'll do round robin. <laughs> uh, it makes a lot of sense. That that is absolutely the plan. Um, the the first step is um, uh, having this advisory panel um, and that has either current or past members of of council staffs. Um, but absolutely, that, that they're going to be a really key key partner in a lot of this. Um, certainly, in in terms of the key informants. Um, yeah, so uh, that that is certainly our our intention, and I should mention uh, maybe speaking to some of the questions down below. Uh, in addition to the federal um, regional fishery management councils, we're also looking at the um, uh, like the multi-state, uh, uh, like the Pacific States Marine Fisheries Commission and the Atlantic States Marine Fisheries Commission. Th those types of consortiums are also uh, they're on they're on our list as well. Um, you, you mentioned Ron Robin, and so I just want to, Marissa or Ariel, did you have anything to add to that? Um, no, Tim did a great job. Thank you. <laughs> Good job, Tim. Um, <laughs> wonderful. So uh, this next question is actually talking about the a SNAP project, um, which I know that 
uh, Kathy, I believe, is involved in this. And so um, this person is just wondering whether you're um, linked to this NAP project, uh, which is focused on resilience to climate change. And it seems to have many parallels with your project as well. Um, so it might be good to you know, team up or at least coordinate with those with that group. Um, so just wanted to offer a chance for you all to speak a little bit more to this and maybe any connections or conversations you're already having with that. Yeah, one of our um, one of our team members, Kathy, is um, involved in the SNAP group. I believe this is one that they're referring to. So, so we have a, a close link, um, <laughs> and 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 would like to apply. You know, whatever their findings are. I think hopefully the timing will work well in terms of when they're wrapping up. We'll be ramping up, um, and so we should be able to apply whatever they finding whatever findings they have to kind of enhance our preliminary hypotheses um, and and incorporate when we're moving forward with the. the the project. Excellent. Thank you. Um, all right. So our next question is more of a comment or a suggestion. Um, so it would be good to get your thoughts as well on this. Um, but fishery management goals tend to include things that are related to stock productivity, um, economic efficiency versus equity, habitat protection, and so on. Um, adaptive capacity has never been a stated goal in several council processes um, where this person has worked. So with that in mind, it might be helpful to frame adaptive capacity as a consideration in support of the stated goals of the fisheries management rather than the goal or objective in itself. I, and that, that it's an excellent statement and exactly speaks to what, what Tim brought up at the beginning about how um, the you know the definition of adaptive capacity is the maintenance of a particular outcome right and so really and one of the barriers to implementing the academic ideas of adaptive capacity has often been well what does that mean right how do you actually make that fit in terms of the specific management goals we have and so really redefining okay what's the outcome one wants to protect and then what are the things that promote the ability for that to be flexible under change and absorb change and be maintained right that's that's a key step we anticipate being you know that that can help overcome that barrier to implementation and so absolutely identifying that is key Great, thanks, Marissa. Um, all right, so there's we're getting some questions, and Tim, you sort of addressed this when we were talking about engagement with the fishery management councils already. Um, but there are a couple more questions about like uh, engaging the federally the federal fisheries managers and also state fisheries managers. Um, and so maybe you can talk a little bit more to like how you're planning to reach out to these people or like create those lists because. There seems to be some questions around like exactly how um, stakeholders will be engaged and then also, uh, you know, maybe surprise stakeholders who are included for surveys and interviews and aren't really aware of this. Like, how how is that all going to pan out? As, yeah, uh, maybe not like the full scenario, since this is still the very start of your project, um, but maybe lend some some comments to that since we're getting some questions. Yeah, and they're all, uh, all fantastic questions. Um, and it, uh, some of it has to do with the, the scope. And then, um, uh, so it, one element of scope is, is that do we dabble into fish state level fisheries management? And I, I, I think we, we just at this point, our, our current plan is we're, we're interested in state management. Um, when there's a, a sort of a consortium of states, um, and that was largely just for tractability. Um, uh, it's a 2 year project and, uh, it, it, there's already a lot, to, a lot of ground to cover. Um, that said, we're not averse to, you know, really informative case studies at a state level. That, um, we ought to be aware of and, and explore. Um, so that that was sort of the, the rationale for the, the pitch the way it is. We, we have no, uh, no, we, we have no grudge against state uh, management. And then, um, to, I, I saw Stephanie's question about uh, stakeholders being involved. And again, that was also kind of a decision. We, we, we've gone through many iterations here and we, we, we really decided to focus on the decision making process. Uh, so the, the extent to which stakeholders, um, uh, are involved or, or is 
at least for the scope of this project, are kind of be limited to the to the, the the ways in which stakeholders are involved in that decision making process. So interviewing council members, which of course includes a lot of stakeholders, is going to be a really big part, and we're going to be interested in how different. Um, uh, members of those, those fishery decision making and stakeholders have different perceptions. Uh, obviously, it would be super fascinating to uh, go, you know, several layers further, <clears throat> you know, thinking about consumers, thinking about the stakeholders themselves uh, in terms of what are their perceptions about what is useful, what is important, et cetera, et cetera. But again, for tractability, we kind of just narrowed in on the decision making process as this launching point. Great, thank you very much uh, for providing some more uh, some more information on that. Um, so our next question, uh, thank you for the talk, firstly. And do you think there will be cost to a region or fishery for building adaptive capacity? Um, how how to justify the potential costs, and how do they outweigh the benefits? It's a good question. I mean, I, uh, I'll, I'll take a stab at this. <laughs> uh, um, I, I think this gets this gets gets to the heart of all decision making, right? Is um, you're you're weighing multiple objectives at the same time, and those objectives play out at different time scales, and some of them are immediate uh, potential negative consequences for you know a longer term potential benefit, um, and that maybe that's the rub. Like maybe that's the one of the big barriers. That is why these sort of more immediate needs uh, are always more pressing. And in a social political decision making context, they obviously get more weight in the decision. So I, I think it's issues like that is actually kind of one of the things we want to explore. Yeah, I think it's a good question. And it is something that we're, you know, that may come out of the interviews or the, or the surveys that we do. Um, Great, thank you. Um, so I know that uh, your topic is pretty nuanced and kind of complex and it can seem abstract. And so I think a lot of the questions we're getting are sort of trying to tease those out. So our next question, um, and I know you probably don't know the answer to this right now, but maybe um, you know some thoughts around it. Um, are artisanal and small scale fisheries more adaptable than large industrial fisheries? I, I would say maybe some are and maybe some aren't. <laughs> um, yeah, I, I, I suspect there's a similar, I, 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 I expect there's a similar range of, of um, adaptive capacity. I mean, I'm Josh Sinner has sort of looked at this a little bit comparing different artisanal fisheries and sees pretty wide variation um, in uh, attributes of adaptive capacity at least. but. But I haven't seen a similar thing on industrial fisheries. I'm interested in what Ariel and Marissa think. Yeah, and then yeah, I think that's a. Oh, sorry. Go ahead, Ariel. No, no. Go ahead, Marissa. It's fine. I was just going to quickly say, I think that's that's one of those context dependencies where it might be that what enables adaptive capacity is different in the context of artisanal fisheries versus the context of a fishery dominated by more large industrial mm -hmm. uh, fleets. Yeah, and I'd say it, you know a, a lot of adaptive capacity in artisanal or small scale fisheries is probably, you know, affected a lot by the characteristics of each of those fisheries and same with large industrial fisheries. So some in each category may be more adaptive than others. And it also probably depends on the context as Marissa said in which they're operating. So I don't know if I would draw a line between, you know, make a strict line between a small scale versus large industrial um, in terms of one is more adaptive than the other, but I think there are a lot of other factors that probably do influence their adaptive capacity. But as Tim said, yeah, I think there's been more work done on the small scale realm than in the large industrial realm. So um, we'll be looking at some of the large industrial ones. <laughs> awesome, thank you. Um, so actually this is the last question that I have so far, but we'll see if any more come in um, as you all answer this last one. Um, again, another question that probably don't have the answer to, um, but it is, you know, another thing that is being asked and people are curious about it. Um, so just want to pose it to all of you. Uh, how does moving to species that are abundant in an area for fishers and fish consumers play into adaptive capacity? 
Uh, if I understand the question right, um, uh, I, I, I'm, I, I read it as moving mean as a, like targeting, fishery targeting. So uh, if, if that is the correct interpretation and, and happy to follow up if it's the wrong one, is uh, I, I think that's exactly that that's exactly one way you could cope with change. So your species X leaves and species Y arrives. And then uh, a, a system that has adaptive capacity is one that has then the flexibility where one can shift what you are fishing. Uh, and that could be a technical challenge. You know, maybe the, the vessels are just not equipped to catch new species. There could be legal challenges because may, maybe those fish belong to another country or another state um, uh, or, or, or any other regulatory uh, thing that prevents you from, from switching. So that those that's sort of an example of a of a perturbation, and then we're interested in um, what decisions are made prior to that that allow for adaptation to happen. Great. All right. Well, that was the last question um, that I had in the Q and A box. Um, so, with, just kidding, we got one more. One more question. <laughs> um, would a potentially better distinction for a proxy for adaptive capacity be the extent to which a fishery relies on shore based processing and the geographic diversity of that processing infrastructure? So, that question of processing, if I'm remembering back in 2019 well enough was something that did come up when we were talking about you know what what some of those barriers might be you know where the fact that the processing itself uh might be less mobile and so part of the ad ad adaptive process that's one of the potential um infrastructure essentially barriers to adaptation that might be identified um so it's certainly one piece of the larger picture and one that might come out as, as very important in terms of a uh, potential barrier. I'm not sure if I fully spoke to the question. Ariel or Tim, do you have anything to add? No, I think you, I think you did a good job in answering that. I think processing is something we were considering kind of more broadly under under infrastructure as, as one factor that may contribute to or be an obstacle to um, adaptive capacity. All right, wonderful. Um, with that, I think that's all we have. Um, thank you so much to our speakers for being here today. I'm uh, very excited to have you talk more about this project. And thank you to all of our attendees who were here with us today, um, listened in and engaged and asked a lot of questions. Um, definitely a lot of food for thought, a lot of things to follow up on. Um, please do follow up with us. Um, you can contact us, our information is on the screen. And if you have any questions or any conversations you would like to continue after today, um, please reach out. Uh, with that, we'll go ahead and end the webinar. Thank you everyone so much.